Good morning, everyone. This is Terry Becker, um, the present CEO of ESPS Electrical Safety Program Solutions, Inc., and welcome to today's uh, open webinar, NFPA 70 CSA Z462 Arc Flash and Shock, Getting It Right. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, you've all been able to uh, make some time to attend, um, possibly on short notice. Um, this is the first open webinar that I've provided, and I, I plan on providing many more um, as we continue to move through our understanding of, of arc flash specifically and ensure that we manage shock as well and that we take these two wonderful standards and that we do uh, properly and effectively interpret these documents. So just briefly, my background for those of you that aren't familiar with, uh, with me and my company. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer based out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada uh, with over 26 years experience. Uh, my background and experience before uh, my consulting in electrical safety was with Mobile Oil Canada, which is now Exxon, uh, DPH Engineering here in Calgary, and Pan-Canadian Petroleum, Pan-Canadian Energy, Slash and Canada Corporation. Um, again, that was extensive experience in oil and gas, uh, electrical engineering related to those organizations. In 2007, uh, and it's the 10th anniversary of ESPS this year, so that is a significant milestone when I left Encanto Corporation as a senior electrical engineer there to uh, create ESPS Electrical Safety Program Solutions, Inc. And ESPS is an engineering consulting-based um, company that provides electrical safety-related consulting products and uh, training solutions to industry uh, in Canada predominantly, but also uh, some clients in the U.S., and uh, looking to international opportunities as well. I am the first past vice chair of the CSA Z462 Workplace Electrical Safety Standard. I'm currently a voting member on the CSA Z462 Workplace Electrical Safety Tech Committee. I'm also the Annex's working group leader for CSA Z462. I attend all NFPA 70 Tech Committee meetings and I participate as a guest in, uh, in Annex, at least the Annex working group and possibly some of the other working groups and do sit in as a guest on all of their uh, tech committee meetings. I'm a voting member on the IEEE 1584 tech committee. We have a maintenance guideline for Canada uh, that published um, several years ago uh, called CSA Z463, Guideline for Maintenance on Electrical Systems. I'm an associate member on, on that document. And again, ESPS provides electrical safety consulting in the form of services, uh, detailed external electrical safety audits, Electrical safety program as a licensed product, the document's completely built, you license it, and then you can develop it uh, with your own resources or resources ES provides, or ESPS can consult to your organization and help facilitate the review, development, and implementation of a complete electrical safety program solution. ES provide, ESPS also provides low and high voltage arc flash and shock training solutions, and ESPS also has developed and provides clients with industry-leading uh, e-learning for arc flash and shock, the electrical safety training system, both an electrical worker and non-electrical worker version of uh, the e-learning is available. The company ESPS, the company website is very detailed, um, outlines all of these products and services, so I encourage you to look there. There's also a wealth of free resources. The uh, mission, vision, value statement of ESPS is on the screen, and uh, ESPS, we believe we save lives, and we believe that we can achieve the goal, mitigation of exposure to arc flash and shock, and uh, reduce risk to an acceptable level. So let's get into today's webinar, but, but before we start, a bit of a disclaimer. Today's webinar is uh, not directly affiliated with CSA or NFPA. Um, the comments I may make related to the third edition of Z462 specifically or the 2015 edition of NFPA 70E are purely my technical interpretation um, of those standards. Any information I may talk about with respect to the pending 2018 editions of 70 years Z462, because of my involvement in the tech committee, are also uh, preliminary and of my own opinion. And I would ask you to consult NFPA and CSA for specific interpretations if you desire. Um, again, just a bit of a disclaimer before we start the webinar. So I wanted to go backwards a little bit very quickly, discovery of electricity and electrical hazards neglected, and, and there's some new electrical injury statistics from NFPA that came out in report that I encourage you to uh, add to your portfolio of resources related to your ongoing management of arc flash and shock. The evolution of NFPA 70E uh, and CSA Z462, the 2015 editions, again, we are into the third year of those documents being published and moving very shortly to the 2018 editions, but I continue to have to talk about um, these two documents. Um, a lot of companies are still um, back at the 2012 editions of these documents, and 
and haven't maybe moved um, into using these. Um, and then obviously we have the 2018 documents pending. Just a few comments on IEEE 1584. Not much detail there, but the new edition, I, at this point, possibly 2019, I sure hope that it uh, publishes then. Um, it's being validated uh, as we speak, so um, internal IEEE processes, um, you know, issues with the balloting, we'll see what happens. But there's going to be some changes there that will need to be managed by industry, um, or else we're going to have a significant problem um, with uh, arc flash incident analysis studies. Status quo for arc flash and shock, some comments uh, about arc, arcing fault and arc flash and, and um, what's happened with, you know, industry's interpretation or what's been communicated. Just clarifying what is an arc flash, and again, this is a webinar about arc flash and shock, but the point of the webinar is getting it right, and we need to make sure that we get it right for arc flash. Uh, and right now, there's a lot of issues still. Um, from the 10 years that I've been doing electrical safety consulting, um, and a voice for interpreting arcing fault and arc flash and the applicable standards and OHS regulations, my concern is that there's so many people out there that I think are very conservative or are not using you know, fact-based information to really identify when an arcing fault is a high probability event or a probability at all and um, some other issues. So we'll just clarify that quick. Um, working on the definition in 70 and Z462, a bit of a new perspective. So I'll just uh, highlight my current thinking on that topic and this will help us hopefully move to clarifying um, arcing fault probability and arc flash and, and when the worker is really exposed um, versus not exposed and uh, there's no need for arc flash shock PPE. So again, we'll broach that topic. Again, I hope I'm gonna be stimulating a lot of thinking, um, a lot of questions, and I think that's healthy. And in fact, we need to continue to do this with this topic of arc flashes. We need to continually be reviewing it and discussing it and questioning it and, and making sure that, uh, that we aren't too conservative, that we aren't going down a path um, that, that isn't appropriate. The risk assessment procedure that was published in the 2015 edition of the standards. Um, I've been working with clients implementing that risk assessment procedure in the last two and a half years. In fact, I was starting to implement the process earlier than that, but it, it wasn't a mandatory requirement of the standards until the 2015 editions. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to introduce it to you or uh, my, uh, my belief of what it is. And it, it's, again, fact-based. It's based on the standards. And some concerns that the risk assessment procedure is not being applied at all, or it may be misapplied or misunderstood, um, that there's no training provided to it. Um, when you've uh, received training, the, the instructor at the front does not train to the risk assessment procedure, and it may be miscommunicated, so then you may not be applying it at all or applying it incorrectly. So I'll give you my perspective. Getting it right. So we'll sort of end the webinar with a whole series of discussions of the hierarchy of controls that we want to use to uh, mitigate exposure or reduce risk to the worker. So I'm going to go through the hierarchy of controls with some bullets and talk about misunderstanding and misapplication. And, and, um, and again, there's, there's unfortunately a lot of opportunity to make things, you know, right that, that maybe aren't. And I, and I'm going to be get, providing some education and, and some comments on, on what I've been seeing when I do go into industry and, and they have implemented the company, the employer has implemented controls and that again some of the controls haven't been implemented correctly or they've been implemented but haven't been managed they haven't been audited um, there's basically no internal electrical safety auditing occurring in industry pretty bold statement but uh, every client that i've approached that has done something uh, really dark flash and shock has not audited what they have actually implemented so getting it right we'll end the webinar with a whole bunch of comments on the, the hierarchy of controls and then just conclude the webinar and and hopefully I'm going to try and allow some time at the end for questions. Um, but if you do enter questions um, in the questions uh, portion of the, of the GoTo uh, webinar control panel, um, I will endeavor to answer a few at the end. And you can get in touch with me um, via email or phone uh, offline. And I will be more than willing to discuss anything that I present today with you, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, we need to have these type of frank conversations about what's going on, again, specifically with Arc Flash. So, Let's get into the detail. So again, the go-to webinar control panel, enter some questions. I appreciate you participating today. Um, and let's go forward. So Discovery Electricity has been around a long time. Um, electrical houses existed as soon as we invented it. And they've been neglected uh, for centuries. And here we are in, in, in 2017, and, and electrical houses are still neglected globally. Um, and in North America, Canada, um, Canada specifically, until I 
got you know into this topic or became aware of Arc Flash back in 2005, which isn't that long ago, 12 years, were neglected. Uh, both Arc Flash and specifically Shock. Shock is, is has more notoriety. It, it's it's happened. It's occurring, but it it has been neglected and mismanaged. So um, it's a global issue. We use electricity everywhere um, in the U.S. 1970s, you know, and in Canada too. Um, the government realized that in, in general workplace safety was was not being managed properly. Um, there was a lot of fatalities, a lot of injuries. So we had some laws get developed. Some occupational health and safety legislation came into place, and then and again that's still evolving. And when you look back, that's say 30 or 40 years, uh, and that's still not that long. Safe installations. Well, we uh, invented electricity, and then we knew that we had to deliver it safely. Um, to uh, end users. So we had codes develop, the National Electrical Code in the U.S., the Canadian Electrical Code in Canada. And again, they addressed safe installations, but not safe work practices. So this is an example of the American Electrician Handbook from 1942 to 1960. If you haven't seen this, it's it's laughable, but it's true that we trained uh, workers to be voltage detectors, right? So uh, up to, I think it's 250 volts, you know, use your fingers. Um, and if, if you feel pain, obviously, uh, then the voltage is there. And then for bell and signal wiring, you know, put the wire to your tongue. And if you, you know, taste a funny taste and a tingling sensation, voltage is present. So really, when we look at where where we where we've been, where we were going and where we are now, obviously, none of this would be acceptable in today's society. So that's good news. Um, so significant um, change in um, industry, uh, both employers and employees with respect to these hazards, but still today, uh, a ton of, of, of opportunity still where it specifically shock is not managed. So again, NFPA 70 came along and um, OSHA said, well, you know, to NFPA, you've got this safe installation standard. Can we have something about safe work practices? And that document evolved. It had too much safe installation content in it. And I'd say the 2004 edition is where it really got cleaned up. And that's where Arc Flash also became more prominent in it um, with the, uh, the hazardous category table method. Uh, as far as Canada, um, we didn't uh, have a Canadian document um, until 2009. Uh, what happened is when I worked for uh, in Canada Corporation and became aware of Arc Flash and Shock via 70E, I contacted CSA and an MOU was being uh, put into works with NFPA to harmonize standards for North America. Uh, I made inquiries with CSA, others were making inquiries, and CSA uh, talked to NFPA and one of the first standards harmonized was 70E. That's when I was asked to be the first vice chair of the CSA Z462 Tech Committee. So as far as adopting these standards into law, OSHA has not adopted NFPA 70 into law. They use 70 language um, within the regulations. In Canada, um, we are seeing some provinces in the last two years move to adopt, potentially adopt, CSA in whole or in part into OHS law in Canada, specifically Alberta and New Brunswick. So We'll discuss that in a little more detail. This is this new report from NFPA, um, the Fire Protection Research Foundation, which amalgamates amazingly um, a ton of electrical incident information that was you know, being generated in the U.S. It was different organizations. You had to go to different organizations, potentially get different results of information. But what happened here is Richard Campbell and Dave Denny, and Dave was the uh, previous uh, chair of NFPA 70, just resigned here in the last little while, um, were... Uh, were contacted to take on this project. So if you don't know about this document, find it. If you can't find it, email me and I'll get you to it. It's public domain. But there's the stats. 99% of fatalities were shock that led to electrocution in the last 20 years. 1% of fatalities are, were arc flash related burn injuries that weren't survived. The important bullet is there's no recorded fatalities due to arc blast pressure, which is an important discussion point with respect to our assessment of the arc blast pressure ha hazard as a secondary effect of arc flash. So Again, statistics help us. They help us interpret information and manage it. So I encourage you to get a copy of this and, and um, put that into your resource toolbox uh, as we move through um, this topic and continue to move forward. And we do talk about risk. It's, it's risk-based language now that we need to use with respect to this topic. So really what's happened, this is just the last three editions, but between the 012 and the 015 is where the, the language changed. 100% to risk-based language aligned with occupational health and safety management system standards. So everything we talk about with respect to arcing faults, arc flash, and shock should be risk-based. You know, what's the risk level, low, medium, or high? Um, what's the uh, potential severity? 
uh, or injury to uh, damage to health versus likelihood of occurrence. So this is a, the risk language that the two documents now are you know, mandatorily requiring, right? And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the webinar. So, you know, the 2004 edition um, of 70E, I think is where the big step change occurred in ArcFlash. The 09, the 012, right? Um, again, and here we are today moving to 018 and, and 70 in literally two months and Z462 in January. So, uh, and I, I do honestly believe that these documents have made a significant impact on mitigation or risk reduction of exposure to workers. Definitely, definitely, but there's a lot more work yet to do. And as I said, for Arcing Fault and Arc Flash, we need to make sure that we, we go down the right path with respect to uh, discussion of the documents internationally. And I, I have been even covered all, I guarantee a 70s, 70s used all over Europe, uh, other, other, other places in uh, Africa and, and South America. But I wanted to give a bit of a snapshot that NFPA 70s have, has, ha, has and will have a global influence on this top topic, which is phenomenal. And Europe, well, the Europe is its own, uh, again, world, and they are working on other potential uh, documents of their own creation, um, and then won't be probably formally adopting 7D, but I know 7D is referenced in Europe. So again, just a quick snapshot, and then where, you know, CSA has a presence, maybe Australia, New Zealand, and I have presented at uh, three conferences in Australia over the last five years, and uh, NFPA 7D is there, they're aware of CSA, but obviously NFPA 70 has the, the higher uh, profile. So it's it's an international problem that, that continues to be uh, addressed, and, and and there is, again, a lot of work yet to be done. So in Canada, OHS regulations, as I said earlier, um, have evolved. Uh, these are handy guides if you're not aware of these in Canada. These are excellent documents provided by Carswell and Hatscan that give you all the regulations, but they give you a due diligence section at the front which is very helpful um, in, in understanding what due diligence is uh, with respect to these regulations, uh, either OHS in Canada or Ocean US. So this is just a snapshot of WorkSafe uh, BC, British Columbia's uh, regulations they have and have had uh, Part 19 electrical safety for quite some time. And it has low and high voltage. Um, specific to these regulations, um, they also have guidelines. So in Canada, some of the provinces or territories offer guidelines to their OHS regulations. Uh, BC is one of those provinces, Alberta as well. Um, and in the case of BC, they just basically advise us um, that with respect to this 1910 rule for low voltage, which unfortunately has a focus on shock, um, that uh, the employer may uh, may want to um, you know may want to reference CSA Z four six two. So it's an informal reference. It doesn't mean it's adopted into law. What's happening in Alberta is ArcFlash showed up um, a long time ago, probably 2004, 2005, 2006, I believe. But it showed up under Flash Fire, um, obviously for the own gas industry. So that's going to be clarified in Alberta where they're going to break out the rule for PPE. And they're going to uniquely identify the electrical arc flash hazard at the bottom here, you'll notice under this rule 232. And then they're going to adopt ASTM F1506 into law. And two clauses in Z462 into law that relate to defining arc flash PP with an arc thermal performance value or a break open threshold energy. So again, that's just two clauses, but it sort of sets off that uh, you may want to do a little more effort in reviewing the rest of the document. In New Brunswick, out in eastern Canada, they are and have been for the last year and a half, maybe two years, uh, and with respect to updating their electrical safety content and their OHS regulations, potentially adopting all of Z462. It says part, but they've also considered adopting all of it. If they do go ahead, I, I, I believe it'd probably be part of Z462 that would be referenced formally. So again, that'll be in the, in the province of New Brunswick County in Eastern Canada. So quickly, IEEE 1584 update in 2019, question mark, question mark. Um, this has been delayed many, many years due to uh, internal processes at the IEEE uh, Again, I'm a voting member on the standard. I've attended every IEEE 1584 meeting, I think, except for one in the last three or four years. Um, my concern is the formulas are going to change and industry may be led down a path because of engineering consultants phoning them and saying you need to redo your entire study. And I temper that you need to step back from that. You need to develop a technical specification that you use as the owner of the electrical power distribution equipment to control the study. And then you update that specification and you reference, you know, the updates or the reviewed information that you will require to be completed 
when the updated document is published. So again, there will be, in my opinion, uh, some significant changes or the perception of, of how significant they are that may set off, uh, unfortunately, um, again, misinformation and misguidance. So uh, I, I warn you when this does publish to understand it before you pay any more money to redo your studies or relabel all of your equipment. Um, one other point in the 2018 edition of 70 and Z462, you will no longer have to install an equipment label on your equipment. You can provide the information to the qualified person using other means if you're an industrial uh, establishment. So again, larger industrial, commercial, institutional, when the 2018 edition is published, it will clarify that you don't have to install equipment labels, which when this publishes, that'll save a ton of money and a ton of time. In fact, I've encouraged clients to put a generic label on their equipment and their generic label points back to the arc flash incident energy analysis studies and points back to their electrical safety program. Ultimately, a company's electrical safety program should, should control these studies being completed and these studies being reviewed. Again, the standards every five years or more frequently. So again, beware that when this republishes, you need to deal with it from a controlled perspective. Step back from it, get a technical specification. If you don't have a technical specification, ESPS has one that we will give to you and you can use and get these studies controlled and understand what needs to be reviewed and updated. And again, equipment labels, I encourage you not to install equipment labels, but to provide the information to qualified persons either directly from the report results table or attach it to records in your computerized maintenance management system. Again, the equipment labeling in itself, and I'll show you some labels in a bit, has unfortunately gone down a path of misinformation to the worker. So this is just a bit of a flow chart where I'm trying to communicate at the bottom that with this new risk assessment procedure, if you do review it and use it, inherently energized electrical work was high risk work because we lacked PPE. So we weren't properly managing severity of injury or damage to health. But what we were doing is we were probably doing a fairly good job of managing like of occurrence. So as I said, historically we invented electricity, we had safe installations come along. Um, we've had electrical equipment maintenance also evolve um, over the years and a lot of evolution in my opinion in the last 10 to 20 years. And then we had these latest editions of 7D and Z462 identify this mandatory risk assessment procedure. So historically on the right, companies just bought PP and sent their workers on training and they felt they were done and they had no documentation. So at the top right in the red um, cloud, electrical safety program developed, implemented and audited is the key control document that I encourage your company to establish and maintain and use that to manage this topic, to manage what you do, where you invest your time and your money. So as we move from what was inherently high risk energized electrical work tasks, through this evolution and the latest editions of 7 and Z462, we achieve appropriate due diligence as well to OHS or OSHA regulations. And then the residual risk level will be lower medium. Again, we apply the hierarchy of controls on the left hand side to reduce the inherent risk to achieve the residual risk to as low as reasonably practicable. Top left, key to likelihood of occurrence and probability. And this, this hasn't changed, but it needs to be more effectively communicated and managed is qualified and competent workers, manage human performance behavior, and manage the condition of maintenance more effectively. Again, what really, in my opinion, was why we weren't having a lot of arcing faults and arc flashes is because we had qualified and competent workers. And human performance behavior has evolved as a workplace safety requirement or a focus area. So there's been more focus on human performance behavior and the last 10 or 20 years. So arcing faults and arc flash with respect to worker interaction have been an infrequent negligible probability of occurring, right? Like of occurrence because we have had qualified and competent workers. If those workers did have a problem, it's probably because there was a human performance deficiency. And then condition of maintenance, well, that's also evolved. And I'd say, that, you know, all the clients I work with um, do have maintenance in place and, and I'm encouraging them to audit the maintenance that they complete. And again, there's another topic of auditing not only your electrical safe work practices and your electrical safety program, but using the same principles to audit your maintenance program, your electrical equipment maintenance program. And again, the strategies and the actual maintenance that your company is completing. Again, just a bit of a, a flowchart to facilitate a conversation of, again, historically where we were, 
to where we really need to go and we're not there yet. We need residual risk to be managed. We need residual risk to be documented that we've actually achieved that risk level. All right, and I'll discuss that in a little bit more uh, detail here coming up. So just what's an arc flash when can occur? Arcing fault must occur. That's abnormal and not controlled and doesn't extinguish. Voltage high enough and system capacity. Probabilistic event, work task base interaction, or abnormal condition contamination with no interaction and possibly no one there. Electrical workers are exposed. Non-electrical workers are not exposed to arcing faults and arc flash as a normal course of their day-to-day -day business. All right? And again, normal operating conditions of energized electrical equipment has been quote, the status quo, but we need to make sure that that status quo is formally focused upon and that we do, and as the owner of the equipment, you do manage your energized electrical equipment to achieve a normal operating condition. That definition was added in the 2015 and 2015 editions of NFPA and 70 and Z462. The last bullet says, with respect to our flash, we, we need to consider operating, diagnostics and troubleshooting, repair and alteration, and isolation. These are four different things, and I'll provide another slide coming up to, to give more information, but that's what we need to define working on uh, around is these four different uh, individual sort of groupings of work tasks. And not all work tasks necessarily expose a worker to an arcing fault probability and a resulting arc flash. We need to get back to that because industry has evolved to believe that normally operating energized electrical equipment has a high probability of an arcing fault and an arc flash, and that is not true. So there's just a visual uh, graphic of an arc flash. Again, we compromise the gap between conductors. We get an arcing fault, ionization of air. We get a resulting arc flash, and there's heat that's released. You know, the, the point of the arc is 20,000 degrees Celsius or 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, we get blast pressure. I'm not going to say we don't get blast pressure, but there, there's blast pressure, and that blast pressure comes with a noise. So we get sound waves, instantaneous, possibly up to 165 dBs. We get molten metal and shrapnel. Um, we get toxic vapor, um, copper, copper vaporizes at 2,400 degrees Celsius and expands 67,000 times. It gives us that pressure and we get UV and IR light. So we've got, you know, these effects, um, that, that are caused by an arc flash and some we can manage with some, with PPE, some, there is no PPE. And it's just, it's, you know, a matter of understanding that and also understanding that those effects don't necessarily, uh, have a high probability of, of injury or damage to health. Arc blast pressure, very controversial, and I'm outspoken in this area. So if you haven't heard this before, um, arc blast pressure and what I call the 40 cal myth, uh, 40 calories per centimeter squared is not a dangerous internet energy level. If we have to classify a dangerous internet energy level, let's say 1.2 calories per centimeter squared and greater, right, or that actually, sorry, let's go back. At 1.2 calories per centimeter squared, that's a dangerous internet energy level because at higher than that level, it will ignite clothing that's not arc rated. Arc blast pressure correlates to distance and arcing fall current, not incident energy. 40 calories per centimeter squared for the last decade has been miscommunicated as a dangerous inch energy level. That is the graph from Dr. Ralph Lee and his research back in the late 1980s. And you'll see distance on the x-axis. On the y-axis is arcing fall current and a theoretical uh, pressure released from an arc flash in pounds per square foot. There's no instant energy on this graph. So again, that is something that I've been advocating that we need to get arc blast pressure properly understood and properly, I guess, interpreted. So I'm going to run a couple videos. I, I think this should work. Um, this one is an example um, of workers uh, doing uh, energized repair and alteration work. Um, this is high risk work. The inherent risk right here is high risk for many reasons. So I'll just run this video, there's no sound. Um, so we have multiple workers. We have one primary worker. This worker is actually doing repair alteration in an energized MCC starter bucket. He grabs a screwdriver and he's, he's, he's moving energized conductors and circuit parts to retrofit in digital power metering. Meanwhile, we have two other workers with a door to the MCC open beside him, obviously planning another job. They're confining him, they're distracting him. The workers, human performance behavior is deficient and becoming more deficient every second, right? He may be highly qualified and competent, but it's human performance deficiency is impacted. He's going to make a mistake. An arcing fault ensues. This is a less than eight calorie per centimeter squared arc flash instant energy. Um, there's also, a, believe it or not, another worker. Here comes the arcing fault arc flash. Leaning on the wall in blue coveralls, I do not know why that worker's there. 
So again, that this was inherently high risk, and then the risk became even higher because of the other three workers in the vicinity of the primary worker. So I could go on for a lot more discussing this this video. And then, ah, oh, secondary arcing fault, arc flash on the worker still there. The guy in the green shirt, you know, he stuck around, he stuck his head. He obviously, he shouldn't have done that. And then the last thing that they do is wrong is they leave the incident scene unmanaged. All right, so when we look at videos related to arc flash, we have to do what I'm trying to do here very quickly is properly in, in, Interpret them. What can we learn? And the learning should be about risk, not fear. You know, what, what do we learn here? What we learn here is that this energized repair and alteration should have been done de-energized. If it was justified, there should have been a permit. And if there was a permit, then an arc flash and shock risk assessment would have been completed to establish boundaries and PPE. Overriding the arc flash and shock risk assessment would have been an analytical risk assessment procedure to ensure that the risk level was, in this case, my, my low, low, mean, or high that was managed to lower medium by applying the hierarchy of controls, then all of those workers shouldn't have been there. The primary worker should have had arc flash and shock PP on. There should have been an electrical work zone with red danger tape tag to keep them out. This next video is another interesting video that I've acquired. It's again, a security cam video. Uh, I call it no look, listen and smell. So when we do have electrical equipment that we believe is operating normally, um, and we identify that it's not, then we should react to that appropriately. So I'll just play this, there's no sound. Um, there's also a table in front of the MCC, which again, could be there temporarily, but there's no worker there, the table shouldn't be there. Um, a worker comes into the scene. And, and the reason that, that there's a concern here is because this worker does not effectively identify the change in the risk level related to the normal operation of this motor control center and one of the starters. So right there, he, he notices it, he goes in, he goes in again. So he is going to now come back out and he's still in the vicinity. He's, he's either hearing something or smelling something because at this point he's probably not seeing any deflection or any smoke or any other, you know, I guess discoloration of the MCC starter bucket door. He leaves the area, not sure why. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna accelerate the video here a little bit. He comes back into the scene. He walks around, now he walks in front of the equipment a third time, uh, and he goes over to the roll-up door, he rolls up the door, and then I'm gonna just play it back here. Now he comes back to the MCC, this is where the mistake occurs for the fourth time. There will be an arcing fault and arc flash. He had four opportunities to identify an abnormal condition and did not react properly. So again, when the equipment is not in a normal operating condition and is identified that it is not, then we need workers to take appropriate action, right? Appropriate action to do what they should, what he should have done, which is he should have removed himself from the area. He should have um, got the area control so no one else came into the area, but he didn't. And, and unfortunately he was exposed to an arc flash, but that is not a high probability event. It is a low probability event. And this gentleman had four opportunities to not be exposed. So this is actually a, a video um, thanks to Transelta for this, um, with respect to contamination of PPE. Um, this was a con coal contaminated uh, arc flash suit. This was an Oberon company, 106 cal arc flash suit, quite discolored from coal contamination. This does have sound. I'm not sure how much of that sound will make it through uh, the webinar, but I'll play it quickly. So the, the issue here is the, the contamination. We need to understand we shouldn't have PPE We shouldn't have PP in use that's contaminated. What, what we do understand is that does it still perform? So this arc flash suit performed. What you see on the screen is what will happen to an arc flash suit when it's exposed to an arc flash. This was over its actual arc thermal performance value, uh, 106 calories, and with the fall current and uh, fall clearing time that they had to uh, maintain at the Connectrix lab to uh, achieve the greater than 106 calories, uh, I was told that it probably was between 120 and 140 calories. So that was a pass, the, the, the after flame was not significant. Um, therefore, it's only a sample of one though. So one question is whether the coal dust um, flashed off and uh, the PP performed. The other issue here is because of the fault current and the fault clearing time, um, we don't see a lot of blast pressure released um, from this arcing fault. And again, um, that discussion needs to continue to occur. This next slide to keep things moving, clarifying working on. So I said earlier that operating needs to be clarified. 
Operating energized electrical equipment is not maintenance. Under normal operating conditions, we don't need arc flash or shot PPP to be worn by workers that are authorized to operate. This includes isolation, opening and closing of circuit breakers and disconnect switches, or having contactors open and close while we're standing in front of motor control centers. This is where the huge debate occurs. So I'm going to make some statements, and if you want, you can contact me after the webinar, um, and we can discuss them in further. Diagnostics and troubleshooting is maintenance. That's defined currently as working on in Z462 and 70E. Repair and alteration, energized, justifies, just, justified, requires an energized electrical permit is maintenance. Isolation work tasks are not maintenance. They are unique work tasks that are energized to put equipment into a safe working condition or part of establishing an electrically safe work condition are acts of isolation, which is racking in or out power circuit breakers, which is not opening and closing. So racking in or out is physically removing a power circuit breaker in and out of a switchgear cell. And then installing temporary protective grounds is not energized electrical work. Those are work tasks related to isolation, right? And they will require arc flash and or shock PP related to them. The biggest item is operating. And right now there's this evolution in industry that operating, normally operating energized electrical equipment has a higher or has a high probability of an arcing fault, which is a, is a false statement. It's not true. It hasn't been the case since we've created equipment that allows us to use electrical energy and to operate, you know, the equipment that delivers it and that gets it to the branch circuit equipment so that we can get some useful work from it. So we need to make sure that we don't go down this path. Um, it has a significant impact and we're setting a precedence that isn't correct. It isn't correct in the context of other uh, equipment. We use specifically mechanical equipment that's operating in a normal operating condition. And um, we need to be very careful going down this path of of operating energized electrical equipment and believing that it's an inherent arcing fault risk when it's not. So just again, a brief introduction of that new concept. So the risk assessment procedure, these are the two clauses in Z462 on the left and 70 on the right. They're identical, they're harmonized. They will point to Canadian US standards. So you'll notice it says CSA Z1002 for the hierarchy of controls and ANSI Z10 for the hierarchy of controls. And the hierarchy of controls is what we're going to apply to the inherent or initial risk level that will be unacceptable to achieve a residual risk level that will be as low as reasonably practicable. So a lot of new risk language that you need to get familiar with. This is a simple flow chart that you'll find in some of these standards about risk, you know, about what is this procedure? Well, we establish the context of it. Um, you have to do hazard identification, and then you have to do risk analysis and risk evaluation. And then you apply risk controls and reduce the residual risk level to as low as reasonably practical. You have to monitor and review this information, and you have to have communication and consultation with the workers that are out there. So simple flow chart, I really like it. I've created a separate flow chart that I use. That's the actual analytical process, but the clauses or the article in 70E and Z462 say identify the hazards, assess risks, implement risk control according to a hierarchy of methods. That's aligned with this flow chart. Okay, and this is an analytical process. If you go on the internet and Google risk assessment, you'll see all these risk matrices. So there's a ton of information out there. So that's what concerns me is there's a ton of information out there for industry to reference on what a risk assessment procedure is. But what I find is that companies aren't implementing a risk assessment procedure. They're neglecting it. They're just saying that completing an arc flash risk assessment and a shock risk assessment is the risk assessment procedure, which it is not. Arc flash and shock risk assessments are components of the overall risk assessment procedure in NFPA 70E or CSA Z462. So again, I encourage you to uh, review what you've done or maybe you haven't done with respect to the risk assessment procedure. Uh, and if you need some help in this area, uh, ESPS has resources and we can help um, give you the information you need, work with you to, to understand what this is and, and have a process that's not complicated. At the end of the day, this maybe looks complicated or it looks overwhelming initial, initially. But once you review it and understand, again, the context of it and that this is a tool to make decisions and it's a very good tool, it will help us better manage arcing fault and arc flash and understanding the probability. And in turn, shock, well, shock, once you do address shock, shock is relatively simple from perspective of reducing the residual risk. So this is actually a risk register table that ESPS has developed and ESPS is electrical hazard risk assessment matrix. Again, so I've just adapted the uh, information 
um, from 70E and Z462 um, and put it into useful tools, a risk register table for inherent and residual risk analysis. And then using that information with the matrix to determine a discrete work tasks risk level. Based again on looking at consequence um, of the event and sorry, sorry, consequence, which will be severity of injury or damage to health and the like of occurrence. And there's three sub parameters of like of occurrence in 70 and Z462. So this is an example of a committee based risk register table. So basically the work tasks that are listed on the left come right out of NFP 70 and Z462. But then you apply an inherent or initial risk assessment, and then you apply controls to reduce the residual risk, and you put some different risk levels on it. It could be low, medium, high, or one, two, three, four. Depends on, again, the specific matrix that's developed by the company implementing it, or they may have an existing risk assessment procedure and risk assessment matrix that can be applied as well in alignment with the risk assessment procedure in 70E and Z462. So getting it right. So we continue to move through this really a quick introduction of some key concepts, but we 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 need to move and continue. You know, safety is a continuous improvement process. So this is what today's webinar is all about. Like let's let's look at where we are. Let's look at where we need to go. I'm stimulating thought, and uh, hopefully you, you're coming away from this today uh, when we're done with like you know, there's some things we need to look at, some things we need to consider. So risk assessment process is positive and defendable. That's what I do like about it. We need to ensure, though, that we manage it, that we reasonably and practically uh, use that tool and the assessment process so that, we're, that we're, we're reasonable, we're practical. Subjective process, and that's where things can go off and be conservatively interpreted. You need to be in the middle. You need to be not too conservative and not too risk-based to use this tool and get effective results. Facts, not fiction. So, again, that's the problem with subjective, then facts. So, facts, not fiction. So, risk reduction is accomplished by applying the hierarchy of controls, the six hierarchy of controls that are listed in the article or clause for the risk assessment procedure and are documented in occupational health and safety management system standards. Well known, well known, but wasn't documented formally in 70 years at 462 until the 2015 editions. So again, we need to be reasonable, practical in assessing and implementing the controls. Misunderstanding or misapplication will not achieve the attended results. This is critical. If you if you misinterpret um, again, and misapply the process and the information that you feed into it, your results, again, will be skewed and potentially very conservative and everything will be high risk. So I guess you have to shut down doing any energized electrical work in your company, which isn't reasonable and isn't practicable in the eyes of the OHS regulations. Again, another misinterpretation about, um, you know, it's against the law to work energized. That's being communicated in Ontario, unfortunately, here in Canada, and it's completely a lie. Right? So it is not against the law to do energized electrical work for a German electrician or another qualified uh, electrical worker, depending on the jurisdiction in the U.S. And so some other topics that I'm more than willing to discuss in more detail offline. So here's, again, the hierarchy of controls, uh, the six that are listed in CSA Z1000 or CSA Z1002 or ANSI Z10 for the states. And we want to apply them with a top-down approach, not bottom-up. But guess what industry has been doing? We've been doing bottom-up for arc flash and shock which means we bought PP, we gave it to the workers, we sent them on training, and then it must be happening. And that's the problem. Without an electrical safety program, applying the controls from a bottom-up approach doesn't achieve the results at all. What you need to do is we do need to discuss eliminating the hazard as a priority, turning off energized electrical equipment before we do work on it, specifically repair and alteration. We do need diagnostics and troubleshooting in an energized state. The second hierarchy is substitution with other materials, processes, or equipment. So over time, we will install new equipment that is safer by its design. We'll substitute old equipment with new equipment. Right now, using arc resistant switch gear is a substitution process. And there's a lot more of that happening. And for high voltage power distribution equipment, I'm seeing a lot more gas insulated switch gear as well. Then we move into engineering controls. So we do want to do these arc flash into energy analysis studies. And we want to use that information then to look at mitigation. Mitigation that's technically feasible and cost effective or costs are managed. We, we still have to have economics considered when we do engineering. So there's a cost benefit analysis to mitigation, right? So we want to apply all the controls. We, I'd love to engineer out the arcing fault arc flash hazard, but with all the existing equipment, we just can't do that right now. In the future, it will be a different discussion. So do the studies, then look at mitigation, implement mitigation that's reasonable, practical, right? Technically feasible. 
and not cost prohibitive. Then we want to look at warning signs and barricading or systems that increase awareness of the hazards, lights, signage, beepers, barricading. So you need to use an electrical work zone for energized electrical work with red danger tape tagged or some other means of barricading which your electrical safety program should identify. The fifth item is administrative controls, training and procedures. So we want to again use training and procedures, right? And then again, there's gaps there. And then PP is last. So PP is last in the hierarchy, but PP is the tool that we will use to reduce harm, reduce harm. So getting it right, no electrical safety program in place. If your company doesn't have one, you need one. There's also a belief that you've created a document that you believe is complete and defendable. I would hazard to guess that it isn't. I've, I've audited too many of these documents and advised clients that they aren't complete, they're not defendable. Right? You just can't copy content out of 70E and Z462 and call it an electrical safety program. What was highlighted in the 2015 editions of both those standards is that you shall have a documented electrical safety program. So if you don't have one, you need one. If you are telling your workers and you're telling the regulator that your practices are based on 70E and Z462. And then there's no field-based documentation. So the qualified person or what I call the qualified electrical worker doesn't have to fill out anything in the field to validate that they're applying the controls that you need them to apply to achieve the residual risk level. And then there's no documented risk assessment procedure to start with, which is a mandatory requirement from 70 and Z462's perspective. So as far as hierarchy of controls, we'll just group them here and continue and, and with the webinar. But de-energization, I'm still seeing lock out, tag out deficiencies in the field. So that shouldn't be there. But again, this is the problem. Occupational health and safety is an evolution, a continuous and proven model. So fine, I see some lock out, tag out deficiencies when I'm in the field with clients. I identify them for them, and then they have to mitigate them. Again, operating, opening, closing, turning on and off, perceived as an arcing fault, high probability under normal operating conditions. We need to change that perception. That is not a true statement, right? So we need to we need to manage that one. We need to get more communication out there and, and get everybody on the same page. Companies believe that their policy says they don't work live, that they're okay, and that they're compliant, and that they don't need arc flash and shock PP because they're turning the power off. There's a misinterpretation or this perception that turning the power off and not testing for zero, which, you know, well, they are testing for zero, but the testing for zero volts is not energized electrical work. I've talked to large con contracting companies specifically, and the CEO goes, Terry, I told all the guys we don't work energized. We're good. And I then asked them, does every you know, electrician own a test instrument, digital multimeter? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they're using it? Well, yeah. Then every electrician in your organization is doing energized electrical work. Voltage measurements for zero or for some value that you're trying to find is energized electrical work. So we've got to ensure that you don't believe a policy and a statement means your company doesn't need 70 years at 462. Energized electrical work is required. We need it. We can't, we can't, we can't use energized electrical equipment without it. Substitution engineering. So I mentioned earlier that there's gas insulated switch gear, arc resistant switch gear now, there's arc free resistant low voltage MCC designs, arc quenching technology, and high resistance grounding, which has been around for a long time. It has a whole new home, right? High resistance and grounding and its benefit to arcing fault uh, probability and resulting arc flash. IR scanning windows and viewing windows, they're being installed en masse. Awesome, right? So we don't have to you know, remove bolt on covers to do a scan. Ultrasonic inspection ports. If you're not using ultrasonic, you should consider it. Not only can we look for hot spots, but we can we can try and hear, right, with ultrasonic, right, technology that arcing faults are occurring before they become a full-blown arc flash. So I encourage you, if you haven't looked at ultrasonic testing, that you do review that, but you can get ports for that too. More insulation guarding and finger safe in newer equipment than in the past for shock, you know, and reducing shock risk. And new technologies are evolving around us all the time. New technologies in the equipment, new technologies in the PP, and there's been some new products brought out from you know, major manufacturers of, of test instruments that help probe extenders, right? Extending the probe, hands are further out of the box. The worker can see their work better. Their hands are still gonna require rubber insulating gloves and leather protectors due to inadvertent movement risk, but probe extenders, simple, low cost, and drives down both arcing fault probability and shock risk exposure. So engineering studies, the problem with these studies is I find that you know, and they're getting better, but initially the engineers were learning, which is fine, but 
I don't, I don't think some of the engineers have evolved to realize that their previous studies were incorrect or that they didn't make the right assumptions. So operating modes are conservative. The two-second rule is not used or the two-second guideline in IEEE 1584. The wrong working distances are used or conservatively, the engineer used 18 inches for everything, both low and high voltage. HRC numbers used in report results. Mitigation not considered. And if it was, may not have been implemented. So again, this is the challenge that we're faced with with these studies. Conservative interpretation for less than 240 volts still with arcing fault probability. So that needs to be worked. And IEEE 1584 isn't necessarily going to provide all the information you need. So you're going to have to review that in more detail. Fear and miscommunication of arc blast pressure. In training, and that's where training that's been provided as awareness level training or other training is fear-based. And again, I don't sponsor that fear-based training. It's not it's not solving the problem. It's not helping the workers. It's actually taking us down a path that we don't want to go. The 40 cal myth cut off for dangerous or no PP available. Unfortunately, the power engineering software, it propagated this problem. It caused it to grow. And now all the software has removed this correlation of the HRC table to the incident energy results, but you're going to have historical reports. And I think some engineers will still report out that 40 calories is dangerous, 40.1 calories. It's not a true statement and it's not dangerous. And there is PP available. Oberon company makes arc flash suits up to 140 calories, arc thermal performance value. The blast pressure is not the problem that it's been made out to be. All right. So again, if you want more information on that, let me know. And there's the, there's the graph from Dr. Ralph Lee again. Arc blast pressure is related to distance and incident energy, not, sorry, <laughs> distance and arcing fault current, not incident energy. Equipment labels. I'm going to show some examples to you right now. This is propagated, and I oh, there's probably, unfortunately, millions of labels across North America that are not appropriate for the worker to read or have, you know, to, to see and, and, and issues with interpreting the label as well. So wrong information, not acceptable misinformation, too much detail or not enough. They're not compliant to ANSI Z535, the misapplication of the word danger and the signal pan versus warning. IEEE 1584 again, the new formulas coming out later this year. Sorry, not this year, 2018. I hope so, 2019. So again, we'll find out. But the implications to these engineering calculations for instant energy you need to manage them when IEEE 1584 changes. You need a technical spec. You need to take control. Do not let the engineer control the decisions you make with redoing your studies in whole or part and the whole issue of equipment labeling. It's a problem. These are examples of equipment labels that I find when I'm out in the field. Danger in the signal pan. The language is basically fear-based language at 0.39 calories per centimeter squared. I could blow on my hand and that's probably going to be 0.39 calories. So again, this is an example again where the labels were conservatively applied because a lawyer or a marketing guy said put that label on. Or the lawyer advised the engineer due to liability to just put everything on the label and push the liability to the employer. The employer hired the engineer to manage liability for them, not to push it on them. This label is ambiguous. It doesn't tell me the incident energy. It just says it's greater than 40, right? The label should tell the worker what the incident energy is. The company's electrical safety program then advises what the qualified electrical worker will do based on the incident energy on the label. The company's electrical safety program should also dictate the specification for these labels and when danger is used versus warning in the signal pan. This label is unbelievable. It's, 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 it's crazy. The language on here doesn't even match Z462. Now, Again, the language has changed in Z462 and 70E. So you will find some labels that use old language, flash protection, flash protection, or arc flash protection boundary, right? But nonetheless, it says level zero. What's that? Um, again, it, 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 this label is not a good label. Here's a label that had something written on it, but the, the writing's faded. <laughs> so you got a basically a blank label. This one's unbelievable, right? Unbelievable, but I've seen probably two or three of these. This is where the incident energy is 11,952 calories per centimeter squared. And the arc flash boundary is 7.3375 miles or 25 miles. So again, it, this just takes the credibility out of this whole process. 
and flushes it down the toilet. So we've got to get these things right. This label again, uh, instant energy at this location exceeds the max safe working level. Energized work is not recommended. 52 calories. So 52 calories, it's greater than 40, right? Dangerous. Again, you know, th those words shouldn't be used. There should be information provided that, um, that clarifies this issue. Here's, a, here's an instant where this MCC has a generic, you know, unauthorized personnel keep out on every bucket door. I've seen every bucket door with a detailed arc flash and shock equipment label on it. This one, look at the labeling. It's, it's over the top. So this is another aspect of labeling. It can be exhaustive where the worker goes, well, whatever, right? You know, worker complacency to over labeling will be another issue for company or there's no labels. So you have some labels and then no labels. So consistency in labeling is also another concern. Electrical equipment maintenance has been neglected. So depending on where I go, the statement is false. It has been properly managed. But in general, we need to make sure that this isn't the status quo, that if it is, we need to, well, we need to rectify it. We need to budget, you know, budget money for better maintenance or more maintenance, right? And knowledge of electrical equipment is missing. There's no electrical staff in a lot of organizations. Managers are not aware as the electrical equipment never fails. So that's another issue. If your company doesn't have uh, an own electrician on staff or a larger electrical maintenance department, and on top of that, an electrical engineer, then you're relying on consultants or contractors. And so you need to maybe approach them. Well, educate yourself first about electrical equipment maintenance, then approach those, those companies you partner with, and then work with them to get you to you know, properly define and document you know, uh, what electrical equipment maintenance you need that you aren't doing, or if you are doing maintenance that you maybe need to make some improvements and changes you know, to the frequency of that maintenance. With respect to maintenance, I talked about mold decay circuit breakers and the best maintenance we can do on them is exercising them. But guess what no one's doing is exercising mold decay circuit breakers, especially the main breakers that are mold decay. So again, there's just an example. When you do review electrical equipment maintenance, uh, make sure that uh, you consider all the way down to your standard panel board mold decay circuit breakers. There are industry standards now. Canada has the new Z463. NFPA 70B has been around a long time in the U.S. And as well, we have the ANSI, NIDA, and the ANSI. MTS, ATS, and MTS standards. So administrative controls, training, and procedures. Training not provided at all or is not adequate. Awareness training is provided. There needs to be more detail in this training. You can't just take eight hours and tell the workers, here's some videos on arc flash and shock. You may be exposed. Here's how to read a label and use the tables and some brief information on the PP. It needs to be detailed arc flash and shock training, low and high voltage. Detailed very detailed, very comprehensive, and then you're going to get that effective knowledge transfer to the workers, at least in the training. The key after the training is the electrical safety program so the worker can apply it. That has been the challenge since 2005 in Canada. Training arrived with no practices, no programs. Companies blindly sent their workers on this training, and then nothing came out of it. Nothing, because there was no substantial benefit to the training when the worker came back, because there was no defined policies and practices documented in an electrical safety program. So we need more detailed training and we need field-based application as the approach. No more what the clauses and, 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 and articles are, but telling the workers how to use that information in the field, how you actually use it to get the benefit of residual risk reduction, right? So again, the training may not even talk about inherent and residual risk levels. It needs to. Fear-based training and too many stories being told. And off topic, you know, you need to stay on topic. Here's what the hazards are. Here's what Z462 and 70 give us as tools to use to provide some information on boundaries and what to do when we're in them, about all the PP that's there. And now with the risk assess procedure, the training must train on the risk assess procedure. And it, it it's an amazing thing if the training does include it because it changes the context for the worker. It makes them think differently about it when you use the words risk and you explain what that means and you explain you know, the, the difference, uh, you know, between um, severity of injury and damage to health and like of occurrence, and we put more focus on like of occurrence. Misinformation in the training, conservative, very conservative training, and frequency is not acceptable. So you trained your workers two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. You didn't implement any practices. They're not using the training information. They don't remember any of it. At ESPS, we do a lot of pre-testing now. So when we do instructor-led training, we pre-test. And I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's very enlightening 
when I do training uh, and the workers go, well, we've received training before, so we're just here for refresher. And when you pre-test them and they don't get the basic information right, that just tells me that they're not applying the information from the previous training. If they apply it, they'll learn it. They'll become competent at it, what I call electrical safety competency. So again, and you audit later on your, your program, and part of your auditing would be interviewing the workers to see if they still have that knowledge and that they're applying that knowledge and applying it correctly. No electrical safety program training. So once you do have an electrical safety program, you've got to train your workers on its requirements. No procedures written. So the administrative controls are training and procedures. So there's no procedures written, or if they are written, the procedures aren't used. Or between one enterprise-wide division in one province and another, they don't know that the procedures exist. So communication and safety go hand in hand as far as making sure you get effective results from your investment of time and money. So electrical specific PP tools and equipment. I could have a whole webinar on this and I probably should, but I've, I've gone to sites where they've got equipment labels and studies done and they haven't even purchased the PP for the workers yet. So it's not specified properly. It's not managed properly. It's not stored properly, not tested current to establish frequencies for the rubber insulating gloves. I continue to find that over and over again. And what it tells me again is the bottom up approach Buy the PP, send the guys in the training and they'll just decide when they need it. And then, and then you don't establish the, the management of, of the hierarchy of controls that you need. And for PP, you need to manage test frequencies for rubber insulating gloves to six months as per ASTM standards, hot sticks and temporary protected grounds. So they aren't documented with a specific test frequency and ASTM standards. But for non-utility, I recommend 24 months for hot sticks and 36 months for temporary protected grounds. So again, you got to manage all these nuts and bolts. And in fact, PP, it needs its own program within your electrical safety program. I call it a program within a program. And the PP is, well, unfortunately, it, it requires management and you have to be on it and it has to be audited regularly. A supervisor needs to audit the arc flash and shock PP given to the workers at a regular frequency to ensure that it is available, it's not damaged, it's being managed properly, kept clean, right? And that where testing is required, that the testing has happened and the workers have you know, the latest set of rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors available. Performance issues, the lab coat style arc flash suit jackets that were out there, you know, 10 years ago, they're still out there. We need to get rid of those. When you bend down, the Velcro opens up in the groin area and then an arc flash occurred and you're not, you know, you're not protected. There's no budget. So I, I tell clients, you got to have budget dollars to buy the PP initially and then to buy new PP as it changes and improves. There's new true color grade technology that Oberon Company uh, innovated uh, and came out with probably a year, year and a half ago. So the true color gray um, lenses for arc graded face shields and arc flash suit hoods. I encourage you that you need you need to upgrade uh, to that for your workers because there's there's no wire cutter discoloration anymore. Visual perception is 100% visual light transmission. So you got to have continual budget for the PP. I continue to see arc flash suit hoods with no hood ventilation systems. I'm telling you that once you get this PP to the workers, you got to have you got to have the, the best PP that's out there, the best PP that will reduce the risk to the worker. So again, the PP in itself should not inhibit the worker from completing the work and increase the probability. Again, electrical work not accepting, electrical workers, sorry, typo there, not accepting the PP and they make excuses. I can't wear the gloves. It's too hot. And you have to work. As, well, the supervisor basically has to tell them, sorry, <laughs> you know, buck up. This is what this is the new world and that new world's not going away. So just to conclude things where I know we're running probably a few minutes over, so I appreciate it. Um, some of you hanging on here a little bit. But to conclude things, our understanding of electrical hazards has evolved from not identifying them at all in Canada specifically, but elsewhere and globally, and globally a lot of work yet to be done. And that's a good thing. So now we're identifying these hazards and saying they are a concern. And they are. It is a valid exposure to a worker um, to these hazards. But again, we have to ensure when you know, an arcing fault and arc flash occurs that we take suitable action. We need to know when that is a probabilistic event and we need to manage it because it's, as I said in this webinar today, it's being mismanaged. It's no longer acceptable to be exposed um, to these hazards. OHNS laws uh, developed and are evolving to include specific legal language uh, related to arc flash and shock, and that's good news. Industry electrical safe work practice developed in North America. International review has been occurring now for quite some time. And there's going to be differences, and, and we, need to, we need to manage that. We need to manage what we believe in North America versus Europe and, and other, other jurisdictions um, globally. And, and, and it's all good. So 
one of the key messages today is, yeah, we need to get it right. But all of this has saved workers' lives. It has reduced the risk right, of exposure. And, it, it's, and when energized electrical work is performed, the, the, the residual risk level has been reduced. But again, the, the, the holes, the gaps, the problems I've identified will change that residual risk level to not being what we believe it, it, it should be if, if, if the controls are properly being applied. So our understanding of arc, arcing fault and arc flash is still evolving. Shock needs to be a higher priority. Statistics prove this. Low voltage for arcing fault and arc flash, less than 240 volts is still a gray area. Lots of opinions on arc flash. Conservative or maybe too high risk. I believe the opinions that ESPS has and that I have personally are reasonable and practical interpretations of arc flash and shock hazards and how to interpret NFPA 70 and Z462. So as we're winding things down here, um, if you do have any questions, I will stay online for a few minutes and answer some of them. If there is no questions, then I will end the webinar here shortly and you can contact me offline at any time. I'm more than glad to talk to you about what I've discussed with you today. Um, share information I have with you and discuss how ESPS and, and I can help you and your company, um, you know, fill these gaps, fill these holes, put in place more effective due diligence uh, with an electrical safety program and external electrical safety audit or, you know, uh, improved training solutions. So let's keep an open mind with respect to arc flash. We need to continually be, you know, under, you know, getting more understanding about that, that hazard. And then the risk assessment procedures I've communicated today, we need to use it to make decisions. It's a good tool, right? It's just, it's not overwhelming. It's an analytical tool. It's actually quite amazing when, when you use it because it's simple. Once you, once you use it, it, you just cycle it through again against another work task. The like of occurrence is important. It always has been, but that's where we have lacked focus. We've been focusing on harm and getting PP on workers as a priority, and that's what 7E and Z462 told us to do. But with a new risk assessment procedure, it changes the focus. It changes the focus to prevention over protection, but we do need both. We need all of the hierarchy of controls to reduce the residual risk level to as low as reasonably practical. Severity, harm, right? And like of occurrence are both evaluated in the risk assessment procedure, as I just said. More attention on like of occurrence. We need to get this right, or as right as we can get it. So arcing fault and arc flash, we need a lot of work yet. And I think we've gone down a path and we need to walk back up that path and get, get back to where we were specific to operating energized electrical equipment. So I know I'm over a little bit, and I do appreciate all of you for attending. Um, this webinar, this first open webinar uh, that ESPS has provided and that I've provided. I thank you for listening. Um, the last sort of comment is implementing an electrical safety program with a documented risk assessment procedure will deliver, will deliver sustainable and measurable performance. Again, thank you for attending today. I uh, appreciate your time. Any questions, please get back to me with an email or you can call me. Um, and I'll more than gladly talk to you about today's webinar and any specific information that's been presented. So uh, I'll open up for questions and uh, I'll just wait a minute or two. And if there's no questions, that's fine. And we'll, uh, we'll move to close the webinar for today. All right. Well, I don't see any questions coming in, which is which is fine. As I said, if 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 you don't uh, want to ask a question at this point in time, you can uh, email me at terry.becker at esps.ca, and I'll gladly answer any question you may have with respect to today's webinar or any other questions that I may have stimulated. Again, thank you all for attending. Um, have a great day, and um, thank you very much. <laughs>